Today we are starting something new, and that is a mini series within our podcast series. So if you don't know who we are yet, I'm Sarah. I'm Chris. And we are most time, and we, who are we? <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. Uh, we are a husband and wife duo who travel for long periods of time. We used to be full time, but I feel like that's misleading now because we do have a home base, but I mean, yeah. we travel for months at a time. And we travel in our truck. And so if you're watching the video format of this, you'll be like, well, you're not in your truck right now. Our last few episodes have been from our truck camper, but today mm -hmm. we're in a hotel because it is having some work done to it. Mm. Um, and so we have been displaced for a few days. <laughs> so join us in this Hyatt hotel as we start our new brand new series. It's a little five part series and it's called Wonderlust 101. And the idea is that this is going to be practical information to either the idea is that this is going to be practical information for uh, beginner travels. But even if mm -hmm. you've traveled a little bit, you're still going to have little nuggets in here, I think, because if you're like us, there's always something to learn from another traveler. Yeah. There's another website, another resource, another little tip that you've never thought of before. So mm -hmm. hopefully if you're an, an experienced traveler, maybe we have something for you. But specifically, this is for those who are a little nervous of taking that first step mm -hmm. of whether it's domestic or international this is going to be practical advice of helping you navigate what you need to do, what you need to consider to get to your first place. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot to consider there. And we have a lot of people ask us all the time. And we have a lot of people who are just kind of overwhelmed mm -hmm. by choosing a location. Or even, I feel like the further you travel away from your home base, the harder it becomes. It's more daunting. I more think. daunting. Maybe the language barrier is greater or... Mm -hmm. Uh, the culture is more different. Yeah, for sure. Mm. So this is going to be not just for international travelers. We'll probably lean a lot into international just because I feel like that's where a lot of the nerves exist. Mm -hmm. But it also has to do with domestic because yeah. a lot of people for their budget or for their first step, they're comfortable with a domestic vacation. Mm -hmm. so, so we're just going to go ahead and jump right in. First thing to consider when you're picking a place to travel what do you think it is? Budget. At least for us. Maybe, yeah. you're, maybe you're not like us and budget is not an object to consider. And if that's the case, take us with you. We'd love to come. But <laughs> Our email is down below. <laughs> but for most people like ourselves, budget's always been something we've considered. It affects mm -hmm. the time of year we go, where we go, when we go, everything. So budget is very, very important, but budget is affected by a lot of different things. I yeah. think our number one tip is to say, start with a big number or not, it doesn't have to be a big number, start with the final total number that you are comfortable spending on a trip, the all-inclusive price for mm -hmm. airfare, for um, accommodations, for food, for activities, all that, figure out that number and then break it down into categories of how much it's gonna cost to get to where you wanna go. Mm -hmm. What do you think the most expensive part about a trip is? It depends. For us, it's accommodations because we typically go for longer periods of time. So mm -hmm. we typically go, if we're going to a different country, it's at least two weeks. So accommodation adds up. Mm -hmm. um, usually airfare is a little bit less expensive because we can be flexible on you know, airlines and even airports that we fly out of. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of people, they're limited by time. So they will be going for less time and they have to fly out of a certain place. So air, airfare will be the most expensive or fuel will be the most expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but accommodation does, it adds up pretty quickly and it can vary a lot. We mm -hmm. don't necessarily stay at the cheapest of the cheap, but we definitely don't stay luxury. Um, we usually do somewhere in the middle of the line mm -hmm. and typically dog friendly. So is there any way that we could cut cost immediately? Like if you're like, all right, I, I'm going to travel on a budget. What is the quickest way to, to cut the cost down? I think the cheapest would probably be to cut your beer out for most people. Um, maybe consider something domestic that you can drive to within a couple hour radius. Mm -hmm. So it'd also take a lot of the stress off if you're traveling solo, especially consider doing something a little closer to home, like dip your feet in and then go back home, figure out what you do and don't like. Maybe you really love the city aspect of it or the outdoor aspect of it. Um, but if you're really determined to go international, I'd say, um, choose somewhere that's relatively affordable. And I would say, go somewhere that has a lot of free activities. Maybe you're not going to do every single museum. I mm. wouldn't probably start with something like Paris where there's a million museums to go to and everything's relatively expensive. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say start with something like Mexico or mm. Costa Rica or I'm not even Costa Rica. Costa Rica's gotten expensive, but Panama, you know, something that's relatively affordable. They speak Spanish, um, which a lot of Americans are at least somewhat familiar with. It's not as daunting as something like Korean. Yeah. <laughs> but I'd say figure out a less expensive destination if you really want to have that international experience mm -hmm. um, that 
yeah, you can, you can afford most things. And I know if, I mean, any money that you can save on a trip is great. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the tips that we do quite a bit is that whenever we go somewhere, we'll go to the grocery store Yeah, and we'll buy food and we'll try to cook in because no matter what, if you're eating out, typically it can get, it adds up over time. I wouldn't, I don't think, I don't agree with that though, because a lot of countries it's cheaper to eat out. Like Mm. in Asia, a lot of times in Asia, it is so much cheaper to eat out as long as you're eating like the locals. Like that is the number one budget saving tip. If you're traveling internationally, do like the locals do. And that means you are eating the food of the locals. You are mm-hmm. traveling like the locals on the ground, like the transportation that they use. That is going to be so much cheaper than, um, you know, always hiring an Uber or eating at American or European style restaurants if you're in yeah. South America or Asia. Uh, eating like the locals or traveling like the locals is a great way to save a lot of money. Yeah. So there's a lot of different ways to cut corners, but a lot of how you cut corners is going to depend on the type of trip you're taking, which is our next point. Mm, yeah. Because you could spend forever on a yeah. budget. Yeah. But what type of trip is this? And I think it always comes back to your why, why are you taking this trip? Is it for, is it because you want to relax? Is it because you want some adventure? Is it because you want some culture? Is it because you're seeing family or is it a work trip? Like, Mm -hmm. why are you doing this trip? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely some categories that are instantly going to be more expensive, like, you know, a spa trip for a honeymoon or something like that. So, but even within that, you can definitely go to less expensive places than say, you don't want to go to Monaco probably (laughs) for a spa trip if you, unless you have unlimited money, (laughs) but you could do something like, um, Bangkok, where you could get an amazing hotel for a lot less than what you can get in Europe, you Mm -hmm. know, and you can have amazing spa treatments for a fraction of the cost. There are different ways you can go about saving money. Like certain things are going to be less expensive in other countries. If you want to do outdoor adventure, like hiking or climbing, maybe go somewhere where the terrain isn't as daunting. You Mm. can go somewhere where you don't necessarily have to have a guide as long as you have a basic knowledge of what you're doing Mm -hmm. and you take the safety precautions. Um, there are places that you can go that you don't have to pay as much for guides or that kind of thing. I'd say figure out your category, whether it's a relaxation trip, whether you're going for adventure, whether you're going for cultural, whether you're going for food, um, figure that out and then figure out the hobbies that you want to, what are your hobbies? What are the things you want to do while you're doing that trip? Mm -hmm. So whether it's like a food trip, you want to do a, a culinary kind of thing. You want to do lots of food tours and you want to experience as much of that food in that culture that you can, but you also really love photography. And so you want to capture it and you want the footage to be really cool and epic and beautiful and colorful. Maybe go somewhere that looks very different than where you're from. Maybe somewhere like Morocco or Southeast Asia. It's really vibrant. You've got the different street vendors and that kind of thing. Like consider, Mm -hmm. consider what you're after. If you're looking for something that's very visual or very sensory overload, if that's something you're desiring, you probably don't want to necessarily, you probably don't want to do something like Europe. If you're from America, you probably want to do something that's a little bit more exotic feeling. Mm-hmm. So figure out your category and then figure out your hobbies along the way. Um, what is it you want to do? What is it you love back home that you would love to do while traveling? Yeah. Whatever experience it is and make sure that it's the right time of the year yes. to do those experiences. You don't want to go skiing in July in Switzerland. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could, but it, pro- it won't be the same experience. It'd probably be very grassy. So <laughs> <laughs> time of year is also one of our best ways to save money. Yeah. You, traveling on the shoulder season can allow you to um, save a lot of money. Uh, a lot of people don't travel on the shoulder season in the tro- shoulder season. Uh, summer typically ends up being the most expensive. And that's yeah. just because that's when most people take their vacations. It's when school's out. Uh, it can get really pricey really fast. But mm-hmm. if you are people like us who can afford the time to travel in the off season or the shoulder season, that's where you can save a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And you also experience lighter crowds. Downside of that, weather can be unpredictable. Um, You may have really sunny, really rainy, it may be hurricane season. So there's a certain level of risk that comes with it, but if you're prepared, you can still have a great trip. Yeah. And even if the weather is awful, you can still have a great trip. On top of weather as a consideration for time of year, you also have to consider holidays Mm. and events. So we've made the mistake and have (laughs) been We've made some really terrible timing mistakes in our past, both domestically and internationally. Yeah. I remember we were in our first van mm-hmm. and we were, you're right, we were in New Orleans for Mardi Gras. On accident. On accident. <laughs> and then we, were, we got out of there and we went to Houston and Houston had a rodeo. Big rodeo and, every year. And we got out of there. We're like, and then we went to Austin and they had South by. It was like event <laughs> after event. We were just kept messing. We, we were bad. Bro. Yeah. That was a that was a rough month. Of, no, it was a great month, but it was definitely like, oh, that was the first time we really 
we need to look at events too. It's not yeah. just about the weather. Yeah. So looking for events, but looking for holidays. Um, if you're American, you might not think about Ramadan, you know, mm-hmm. say you're wanting to do a food tour in Morocco. You've got to consider Ramadan because they do fast during that. So you, you got to consider the, the local holidays um, and also events. So say you want to go to Germany, Oktoberfest. Mm-hmm. Oktoberfest is going to be a more expensive time, but if you don't really care about Oktoberfest, don't go during Oktoberfest because yeah. that would be considered shoulder season for most of Europe, but that's going to be really expensive in Germany. Yeah. So you got to look and see what is big in the, the area that you want to go. Yeah. Go to the website of whatever country, whatever state, city that you're going to and just click on the calendar. Just Google. Yeah. Google's a great way to find out like what events are happening. Maybe you do want to be there for mm-hmm. that and it's worth a little extra money. Or maybe you just need to figure out when does it start snowing in Utah? And like book your, like when is the best yeah. time to snow or best time to ski or whatever? Yeah. Um, figuring that out will definitely be a great starting point mm-hmm. um, if you are going for something pretty specific and that will also dictate how much you can spend and how long you can go for. Yeah. Speaking of snow and us being Southerners, we really don't know how to drive in the snow. That can be a safety issue can for be us. A safety <laughs> issue. So are there any safety considerations that we should think about when booking our first trip? For sure. Um, both domestically and internationally, there are places you should always be aware of what's happening there. Are Have there been protests? Have there been... Um, have there been a string of crimes lately? Like, I mean, there are even domestic, I mean, the U S has just as much crime as any other place in the world. It seems like, so yeah. you've got to be aware of what's been happening in that specific place. It's easier for me to talk about safety internationally. Cause I'm just so familiar with safety in the U S mm-hmm. I mean, aside from so don't walk alone at night, don't wear flashy jewelry or carry expensive electronics, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Like the basics aside from that, we like to go to the state department's website. Not mm-hmm. stuff that's really helpful for international. Um, the U.S. State Department will rank safety in a country on a scale of one to four, one being the safest and four being the most dangerous. So one is this is generally a very safe place to be. Four is we do not recommend you going here. There are large threats of terrorists or whatever it may be. Um, and it can change quickly. Uh, a lot yeah. of a lot of places in the world, including the U S things change very fast, but especially Mm -hmm. in developing countries where you're going to want to stay on top of it. Um, for example, like Peru, Peru has been a pretty safe place to go the last several years, but last year they had a lot of protests and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so you just, you have to stay on top of it. I think Peru is a great place to go again right now, but you do want to be aware of things can change fast and, uh, you want to have travel insurance is very important. Mm, Yeah. What is there a travel insurance company that we should <laughs> You're just feeding me questions because we use we know what we I know use. well I know what we use but I like, can link it down below but yeah, yeah. safety wing yeah we that use is, safety wing that is going to be an affiliate link but yeah safety wing we've been very happy with them they yeah um they offer I think I can't remember how much it is a month but it's really not that bad you can do month to month basis and cancel it so if you're going for two weeks you only have to buy it for a month you don't have to buy it for a whole year or something yeah. but they one of the things they offer is if there is a um political you have to get out of the country they will help you transport out like it covers Mm -hmm. you um it also covers like medical expenses that kind of thing so having travel insurance can save your butt thankfully we've never had to use it but it's there it's just nice to have yeah and i do want to say that most places are safe to visit you know occasionally you will what you see on the news is a lot of times one percent of that actual place now you still need to be smart and safe yeah there's there's definitely certain places you should avoid um even considering your passport the passport that you carry i mean we carry american passports and americans aren't the most beloved people in a lot of places so (laughs) you have to be aware of how you're going to be potentially treated what are the what are the cultural what are the international relations with some of the places that you're going but Mm -hmm. yeah like you said most places are safer than what you're going to see on the news but that doesn't mean you need to bypass what you're seeing there's always um there's always truth in there so um do your research and just always 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 be aware of your surroundings yeah just know what to look for um actually our last episode with bethany taylor Mm -hmm. was a lot about safety just in everyday life she's an american living in japan and Mm -hmm. you know japan's like notoriously safe but if you go to her instagram she has all sorts of practical tips for you know how to park safely what to look for if you're traveling alone or in a group like just you can cut down on the amount of danger you put yourself in Mm -hmm. just by being aware putting down the phone yeah all right we're at the computer we're about to book our first trip yes right yeah all right 
should we do like a city or should we do more like rural adventure? That's yeah. up to you. That has to be up to, the, I can't tell them. I know what I like and that changes from trip to trip, but yeah. I'd say figure out what you're comfortable with. If you live in a city and you're comfortable with cities, maybe start with the city. Cities are oftentimes where you're going to have um, the best, if, if language is a language barrier is a concern, if mm -hmm. you're doing international, major cities are going to have the most English speaking people, typically, not typically. always. I mean, there's certainly yeah. countries that you're they right. don't speak much English, but yeah. you're going to have better transportation, bigger airports. You're going to have um, probably more variety and accommodation. So if you're mm -hmm. nervous about booking your first Airbnb, well, you can book a hotel, even an American chain hotel, if that makes you more yeah. comfortable. And I think that's something that we don't really touch on too much, but we, we should mention that, you know, if we go internationally somewhere, mm -hmm. sometimes we like to stay at a, an American chain hotel in whatever country that is, because you, you have a concierge, they're, they're, they're able to help you. I always think about the office when he's like, yeah, the concierge, it's like the geisha. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the geisha of Canada. Um, <laughs> I always think of that, but it is true though. It, it eliminates some risk. It, yeah. uh, it'll, it'll, yeah. Let's be clear. We're not always staying in hotels. In fact, we rarely stay in hotels that are expensive enough to have a concierge. It's true. Yeah. But what you can do even in, like we love supporting local when we can, whether that's an Airbnb or a boutique hotel, but we do travel with Kramer. And so a lot of the dog friendly hotels do typically be, do typically be, do, are typically American chains, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But with that comes a certain level of security. And I do recommend American chains maybe if you're a new traveler and you're American and going mm -hmm. international, only because there's going to be a certain standard that's upheld that is going to be familiar. You know, the rooms are going to have certain standards. You're going to have um, English speaking people working the front desk that can help mm -hmm. you navigate something. I mean, even for example, staying in Merida, Mexico in, in February, March, when were we there? Uh, April, like, April. Yeah. We were in oh, there in yeah. April. Um, anyway, we stayed at just like a residence inn or something. We were there for a week. And while we speak a very, very tiny bit of Spanish, having somebody at the front desk who spoke English is always really helpful. Like we always try to do our best and, you know, communicate in their language. But, you know, we were able to ask him, hey, we got these two places recommended to us. Which one would you choose? And he could tell us, you know, in our language or, you know, I would recommend taking this transportation, not this transportation. So there is a certain luxury that comes with staying in a familiar hotel chain, mm -hmm. even if it's not like a really expensive yeah. one. Yeah, and I will say that we've stayed in Airbnbs both stateside and internationally mm -hmm. and i do feel like staying in airbnbs internationally typically is a lot better can be yeah, for can, sure. can be we have had some bad experiences both stateside and internationally and um it stateside it, it is easier to communicate with the host mm -hmm. you know obviously internationally it's a little harder a little a little more difficult can be um but actually, Airbnb tells you what languages the host speaks. So mm -hmm. I was looking at one in Thailand recently, and the host spoke Thai, China, Mandarin, or in English. Or so. She spoke multiple languages. I was like, well, it's very advanced, yeah. but good for you. I, I love to support local when we can, but having a dog-friendly hotel is an essential for us. Mm -hmm. um, and with hotels versus Airbnbs, a lot of times you get a gym, and staying fit on the road is really important to us. We really do like to be able to work out. It helps us mentally physically it wakes us up i mean everything about it it allows us to eat more when we're traveling having a gym is really one of those things that we absolutely love and mm -hmm. sometimes you don't have it and that's when the stairwell in the apartment building comes in handy you just go yeah. up and down the stairs <laughs> the gym is important but also laundry that's laundry. the perk of having an airbnb but some hotel chains have laundry yeah yeah or laundry services depending yeah. on where you're at in the world <laughs> ever paid for laundry service one time in thailand yeah we did You're and right. that's because they came and they took it they did they picked it up and everything they, they that picked, was awesome that was awesome <laughs> so they yeah so that was great yeah but the ho i'm gonna go back to the one in merida it was just a marriott chain we got a great price on it i think it was the same price as staying local because we got like a long-term stay kind of thing like it was a week deal but they had laundry machines they had a great gym they had uh laundry they had a pool and they were dog friendly they even had a free shuttle to go within like five miles or something so that was a great find considering accommodations can really determine the experience you have and also where that accommodation is in the place that you are. Like, yeah. oh man, accommodate. I love talking places to stay. That's one of my favorite things is just like find these really cool hotels or Airbnbs. Well, how do you find them? I think it's just a matter of looking. I think I like to do research on where do I want to stay in that town? Like what neighborhood 
there are so many blog posts out there on like the best neighborhoods in Seoul or mm-hmm. the best neighborhoods in London. And you can get their opinion on like what makes that one good. Maybe it's great for nightlife. Maybe it's great for culture. Maybe mm-hmm. it's um, family friendly and has a lot of playgrounds. That's the kind of stuff, like figure out what neighborhood you want to stay in and then figure out what hotels or Airbnbs are in that area and try to get close mm-hmm. to it. Um, and then if you're planning on taking public transit, make sure you're near a public transit stop, like a subway. There's a lot of things to consider, but that depends on who you are and what you're wanting to do. But accommodation, think of that as your home base, your hub when you're traveling. You want that to be somewhere that's safe, that's comfortable, and that's convenient. Yeah, and you brought up a good point about transportation. I mean, it's one thing if you are from the States and you're staying within the States, you have your driver's license, you can pretty much drive wherever, or you're taking public transit within the city. Mm -hmm. But maybe you're going internationally and you maybe like for Iceland, Mm -hmm. you know, we from Iceland, you can get from the airport and take a bus to Reykjavik. 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 (laughs) Reykjavik. I think that's right. You could either take the public bus around Iceland or if you don't want to do that, you have to drive. And so what do you need to drive an international driver's license? Is yeah. that what you're talking about? Yeah, that's yeah, what I'm yeah. trying to get at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. International driver's license. Um, that, there are actually two different ones, but you can go to AAA in America and just pick up one, and it's good for a year. It was pretty inexpensive, too. It was, I, yeah, I can't remember. I want to say it was $50. Yeah. Don't quote me on that. But something like that. We just went in, got it real fast. Yeah. It's not too bad. And we, we always err on the side of we want to have that. We want to you be have safe. To in yeah, some places. You, we've never once, being international, been asked for it. No, we haven't. Not even running the car. Because uh, some places our driver's license is good. Like in Iceland, they accepted American driver's license. But in Brazil, they weren't supposed to. But I don't know if they ever they asked for it. They never asked us for I, it. I did read that if we were running one in Korea, they do ask for yeah. it. Yeah. So I would err on the side of always have it. Always have it. Mm-hmm. That, especially if there's a wreck or something like your legal driving. Yeah. Um, I don't think your insurance will cover you unless you have it. Like there's certain insurances that will cover you when you're driving internationally. Um, Mm -hmm. One of the Chase credit cards, we don't have this, but this is our next, we'd love to get this credit card. I'm not a big credit card pusher, but I think the annual fee is like $100, but it gives you primary auto insurance coverage internationally. Mm. And considering you're going to pay $100 in auto insurance for a week on a car, like that pays for the credit card. So if you're planning on renting a car internationally, that might be worth checking into if you don't already have a policy that can cover you. And there's a difference between primary and secondary insurance. So look that up and you need primary. Yeah. So, all right. We've already talked about, they're trying to pick their very first place they're going or mm-hmm. picking a trip. You know, we've determined what type of trip it is, yeah. the why behind the trip. We've determined a little bit of the cost, a little bit of, um, you know, if it's safe for the time of year, all of that. So we have that. What are some practical resources mm-hmm. that we can use? Yeah. All right. I think number one, tip would be using Google flights for Mm. booking your flight. They actually just came out with an update too. I did hear that like just this week. So Google flights is how we um, book our flights. We always have because you can book them directly with the airline, which gives you so much more flexibility. If you need to change a ticket, if you book through somebody like Expedia or kayak or booking.com, mm. you are at the mercy of those vendors and True. they are not compassionate. <laughs> Usually no. I don't want to knock all of them, but you are going to be much better off if you book all of your reservations directly with the source, whether that's hotels or airlines, whatever it is, do it. Mm-hmm. Cause I can't tell you how many times we've had to change a flight unexpectedly or a hotel, but because we booked directly with it, we were okay. Yeah. We were fine. And become a member of whatever company it is. Like, you know, if it's for Delta, become a Sky member or whatever. If it's for Marriott, become a Marriott. It's free. Yeah. It's, it's free to join. And the points really do add up. Like we don't think we stay in hotels that often, but most places have their points roll over and we actually have gotten multiple nights free this year already. So Points do add up, and if that's something that you are looking at doing, just sign up for them. They're free. Yeah, like, super free. They're going to take your information anyway, so just go ahead and get yeah, the yeah, account. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so like Sarah said, we try to stay away from things like Expedia or mm-hmm. hotels tonight. So occasionally we will use use them, but for the most part. The only thing we book through them is rental cars. That is true. Because you book it, but you don't pay in advance, and then you get there and you pay directly with the counter of the place. But you, the online things like kayak will give better deals than directly with the vendor. So rental cars are okay to book. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. No, I 100% agree to that. As long as you don't pay in advance. Otherwise you get right back into the same position. And and let's be real. Loyalty to the rental car companies. Completely useless. Yeah. All right. So (laughs) I mean like we've, how many cars have we had to rent this year driving and enterprise will not 
will not give us our points. Like we have to hound them for our yeah, points. It's, it's always, it's always a headache. I will get my free rental. Yeah. So, all right. Maybe you're looking for flights right now. We Google flights. Um, that's what we use primarily mm -hmm. looking at different flights, but there are other resources to get cheaper flights. Maybe if you have a little bit more flexibility. Yeah. Going, mm -hmm. which a lot of people know it as Scott Sheep flights. They recently rebranded, but they have been around for years and they are by far the best service out there for finding good flight deals. I think, I think they're the best. Um, we have used a couple other ones, but I really like them. They have, they've been around for a long time. It seems like their algorithm's the best. Mm -hmm. The prices are good and they have a free version and a paid version of their service. Um, we've actually never paid for it, but we've bought flights on the free one. I like going. It's a great way to find affordable flights with that, you're going to have to book in advance. Usually like usually these deals are for like six to 12 months in advance. Yeah. Um, that's harder for us because we can't usually schedule out our lives that far. We're usually yeah. pretty constrained by time, but if you have more time and you need to plan in advance, that's a really good option for you. When is the best time to book a flight? I have heard internationally it's best to buy about five weeks in advance, but you're going during peak season or you're using your points and miles to book, you're going to want to book far in advance. Like mm -hmm. if you're going peak season to Europe, like summer season, you do not want to be booking five weeks before because everything's going to be taken. Yeah. Every good deal is going to be gone. So I would just start looking actually Google flights will let you track prices. So you can say I'm tracking prices from Atlanta to Rome and you can put up alerts and it'll send you like, Hey, that flight that you've been watching just dropped. Do you want to book now? Mm -hmm. um, but one of the new features Google just came out with is telling you when the best time is to book those oh, flights. Yeah, that's so true. I haven't used that. So that may just take all the guessing out of it. Yeah. But um, I have heard people say using a VPN, um, say you're buying a flight from the USA to Ireland. If you use a VPN from somewhere like Brazil while you're doing that and booking that flight, even if you are in America at the moment, you will get a better price. Mm -hmm. I have not found that to be true. I've tried that several times and the prices always end up being exactly the same. Mm. They'll change the currency, but past that, I'm like it's the exact same price. I, I don't know if those days are gone now that people are getting trickier with their little VPNs and people mm -hmm. are getting more, more savvy um, at those little hacks if that's changing. But um, that used to be, it's worth, try, it's worth mm -hmm. trying if you have the time yeah. and a VPN. All right, so we've booked our flight. Yes. Now we need to book our hotel. Mm -hmm. Hotel. Um, I like, I, I liked, honestly, Google is really sort of how I like to plan my trips. Like it really is like, we don't use Google for everything, but Google maps, if you have done your research, like we talked about with the neighborhoods, like mm -hmm. you know what neighborhood you want to go to, you can go to Google maps, find that neighborhood in that city or wherever you're going and search hotels. Mm -hmm. And then within that on Google maps, you can sort by amenities, which includes pet friendly. It can include how many stars, the price, um, maybe you want laundry and you can find hotels on that map. You've got to be careful because they aren't always accurate. Sometimes they say dog friendly and they're not or vice versa, or they'll mm -hmm. have laundry or they don't. Um, but that's a great way to start at least finding the hotels and then go to those specific hotels that look interesting to you that look like they might be within your budget. And Look at their FAQs. Look at their policies on those kind of things that are important to you. Do you have a gym? Do you accept kids? That kind yeah. of stuff. But Google Maps is a great way just to see all your different options in an area. Yeah. And what we use, it's not necessarily for, you can use it for anything. It's one, one of our favorite apps that we use, but it's called Notion. And yeah. we will put all of our information, all the hotels, mm -hmm. all the flights, everything that we can into Notion. Yeah. Um, which oh, it's like a project management system. It is. A lot of people will still use Excel um, or Sheets by Google, whatever you want to do, whatever's free. But we like Notion because it has so many built-in features. This is not sponsored. We just really like Notion. Um, you can create, like, we put all of our confirmation numbers, all of our check-in and check-out times and dates and mm -hmm. how we're going to get from point A to point B, all that yeah. kind of stuff. It's... Hi, Kramer. We're just, Kramer's here. <laughs> we put all of our information in it. And it just keeps it streamlined. And they have a, a phone app or the computer app where you can view it in the browser. So it makes it really handy. In fact, that's what we're using right now as we're looking at our notes yeah. is we organize our podcast that way too. And so we're just like pulling up our notes that we wrote earlier. Organization's key. You don't want to, you, while you're planning and then while you're on the road, you want to make sure you have everything at your fingertips and you're not digging for no. information. Yeah. And you want to make sure too, especially if you're traveling, traveling internationally, that you have a way to get to the internet. 
and you know, and maybe you're traveling, you have Verizon here in the States or AT&T, a lot of times they will have um, like boarding pass. They're like travel passes. They're expensive. They came, um, yeah. They're really expensive. Like Verizon, I remember it was like $10 a day or $20. It was something crazy. For minimal. For minimal, like half a gig. So a lot of times when we get into an airport, um, we will look for a SIM card um, that we can change. Or they have eSIMs now with the new iPhones. But I've heard those are kind of unpredictable still. Yeah. Those don't give you the the full yeah, so we still like data to, phone number kind of thing. Yeah, so we still like to change out our SIM cards. It just makes it easier, especially if you're in a new place. Yeah, I do some research on the destination of where you're going. Sometimes the SIM cards at the airport are more expensive, but sometimes you need that SIM card before you leave the airport to book that taxi or yeah, that Uber exactly. or whatever it is. Some countries will even allow you to reserve your SIM card before you even arrive. Like Korea did that. Mm-hmm. We didn't. We didn't do this in Korea because we have Google Fi, which allows us to. Um, we have international coverage and domestic coverage because we're back and forth a lot. We just switched over from Verizon recently. But and that's an option if you travel a lot. That's that's a solid option. But SIM cards are great. They're really easy. In many countries, you can go to a 7-Eleven or a mall at, to a kiosk and just buy more data as you need it. Mm-hmm. But um, some places you can order them and pick them up at the airport. So if you order ahead, it's cheaper. That's how Korea was. Mm-hmm. So do a little research on finding the best providers, like what carrier is going to be best in that country and then how much it's going to cost you to get a ballpark and then where to pick it up. So you know that when you land, you know how to get there. Yeah. Yeah. And typically, I mean, especially coming from the States, the SIM cards are pretty inexpensive. Data, I think data is most affordable in the U.S. and Canada or something like that. Yeah. It's very expensive. Yeah. Very expensive in, in the U.S. and Canada. So if we are a, We've given some practical tips. We've talked about the the who, what, when, where, why, all of that good mm-hmm. stuff. If somebody's listening right now and they have no idea where to go, okay. like their first trip, maybe not their first trip ever, but maybe like it's a big trip, where should they go? Like what would be the easiest or a good first international trip and a good first domestic trip in the U.S.? It really depends on what you're after. But I think in the U.S., especially if you're going during like peak or shoulder season, I think Seattle is a great place and we're biased because we love Seattle, but Seattle is one of those places where you have major city mm-hmm. and you have outdoor adventure mm-hmm. right there. You yeah. have everything. You can also have spa treatments if that's your thing. You can have a lot of great food if that's your thing. Mm-hmm. It can be on the pricier side, even by U S standards. Um, another great one would be Miami. If you like major cities, cause you can get really great Cuban food and yeah. you also have Biscayne Bay or Everglades or the Florida keys or within yeah. like an hour or so. And I will, it. I will say Miami, like when I first hear Miami, I think of flashy, I think of it is South, crazy. Yeah, yeah, South beach. <laughs> that is not my vibe whatsoever, no. but there is a side of Miami that is beautiful and you don't have to necessarily do that. Yeah, if you can do Miami, like Miami, if that's your thing. But if you like quieter, you can find a great hotel and then, you know, book a sailing trip around Biscayne Bay National Park. You yeah. can book a sailing trip and um, whether it's a day long or multi-day, you can even get chartered flights from Miami to go to the Bahamas for the day if you want mm-hmm. to. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can do. So I think those are my two major city recommendations. If you're looking at doing like outdoors, like great outdoor adventures and you're nervous about the outdoors, I'd say Colorado would probably be a great one. The The conditions can be extreme. Yeah. Colorado. Really high elevations. You know, but I, w- I would. You don't have to worry about grizzlies is what I was thinking. Yeah. You could. I would say Utah. Utah is great. Yeah. Utah, Utah would be a great one. Yeah. Utah, you would fly into Salt Lake or drive to Utah. Or Vegas. Yeah. Or Vegas. And you could hit the Grand Canyon. Mm. You could hit Zion. That's Arizona. Well, not Utah. I know. I know. Yeah. 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 I just thought of Vegas. So you could hit <laughs> That's Zion. That's Nevada. <laughs> yeah. You can hit Zion. You can hit Arches. You can hit Utah has a lot. Well, Utah has five national parks. I think that's a great one. Yeah. yeah. A great for outdoor, especially like, it, it, it's a great place if you're first starting out and it's a great place for being advanced too. Mm. Yeah. Man, the U.S. is so hard because I feel like U.S. can all be pretty expensive. I mean. It can be. Yeah, hotels in the U.S. are just really expensive right now. And I'd say Europe, too. I think everything's gone up. But the U.S. is really pricey. So Mm -hmm. if budget is a concern, I'd say either camp and Mm -hmm. have your camping gear or um, stick somewhere close to home so you can save on the transportation. Stick somewhere within like a four-hour radius, five-hour radius, something that you're not going to break the bank on gas. Pretty much anywhere in the U.S., you're going to have something interesting within five hours. Even if you're within, 
Kansas, parts of Kansas can be to the Colorado mountains in five hours, you know, Mm -hmm. a few hours. So there are a lot of great places within a day's drive of pretty much anywhere in the U S okay. Internationally, internationally. All right. I've never been, because a lot of my family has never been international. Like they've, they haven't crossed the U S border and that's true for a lot of people. So where would you go? If it's borders you're concerned about and you've never used a passport and you're just nervous about the whole customs, like you're worried about being interrogated, that kind of thing, start with Canada. Canada is the way to go. Canada is the way to go. (laughs) Our friendly neighbors to the north. (laughs) Everybody thinks they're friendly, but I will say that going through the borders to Canada, sometimes it can be a little grumpy. Not grumpy. They're intimidating. I mean, the U.S. is no joke either going back. But yeah, Canada, man, they don't mess around. So they're not all so friendly, friendly, but... Canada's an awesome place to start. We love BC. Um, even the Yukon's amazing. But uh, Alberta, if you want to do Banff and Jasper. Calgary. Uh, fly into Calgary. That's a great one. We love that area. Yeah. There's a lot of really awesome places in Canada, places we haven't even been yet. Like we've really never covered the east coast of Canada. Not yeah. much. Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia looks awesome. So Canada would be a great easy start. Want a language barrier? Consider doing... Mexico. Mexico is not as unsafe as what people say, especially if you stick to popular areas. So Mexico would be good, but I mean, or Quebec, or Quebec if you want f- those French the, Canadians, the friendly French to the, the north. French, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So you could do Quebec or Mexico. Mexico City is a great first international city to yeah. go to. There are certain neighborhoods you can definitely stick in to keep you safer. Um, it is a massive city. Yeah, taking known transportation like Uber or a taxi to your neighborhood and then go from there, you're not going to, you can eliminate putting yourself in dangerous positions. But, okay, let's say you want a little bit of culture shock. Okay, so so say say you want to go farther than North America and you're nervous about a language barrier. Most people in Europe speak fluent English. Now, it's Mm -hmm. not polite to rely on them to speak to you in English, but... In a pinch, most people can help you. There's going to be signs in English in a lot of places. There's going to be, everything's going to have, I shouldn't say everything, but a lot of things will be in English too. That's sort of, that's sort of a universal language at this point. I mean, a lot of people speak English as a second language. So Europe is pretty easy. And on top of that, Europe has some English speaking countries. I mean, mm-hmm. you've got yeah. Ireland, England. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's, that could be a great option. Um, Europe, I would say, language barrier has never been a concern for me in Europe. So Europe is easy, but Europe comes with a price tag. So say budget's a concern, you want to go international and you want to stay safe. Where would you go? I'd say for the risk takers, I'm asking myself questions now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. You lead this conversation, Sarah. For risk takers. No, I can't say I've been everywhere in the world. I haven't been that many places. For risk takers where? No, I shouldn't say risk takers, but say you want an extreme, but you want to stay safe. I think Thailand's a great place. That was our first major international destination. I still love it. It's called the land of smiles for a reason. Yeah, It's funny to talk to Americans because Asia, for whatever reason, is very intimidating. Mm -hmm. It's just very intimidating for Americans to go to Asia. And it is one of our favorite places to go. I think that's our, yeah, I think if we had to pick up and move to a continent right now, it'd be Asia. It'd be Asia. Most people over there are incredibly hospitable and nice. And it's, yes, it is culture shock. It can be. I don't think I was culture shocked, but I think I also live for the exciting. Yeah. But that's. But you know what? If you still need, no matter where you're at in the world, there will always be a tourist spot. There will. There will be a Starbucks, a KFC. Most places in the world, for sure. There will be McDonald's. If you were if you were hankering for some like good old US of A, there will be a little street with, with some of that. You can find a lot of things. I mean, maybe not in every country. I guess not for sure, not in every country. And <laughs> you know, but uh, most of the countries you're going to start with for your first travel destination will have those things that are familiar. But I don't think we're traveling for the Starbucks and the McDonald's. No, no. But I think sometimes if you're just worried. If you're worried, and for whatever reason, people are worried about Asia, about going there. But I, I it's would recommend. It's just so foreign. Yeah. It's, it's so foreign. So they're not. Yeah. It's just totally different. Asia is awesome. I think the people are so nice. It is a longer flight, but if you get a great flight deal when you get there, it's affordable. Yeah. But maybe, 
maybe you don't want to go all the way to Asia. What would be another good one? I think Central America is a really great starting Central point because Spanish is a relatively simple yeah. language for Americans to pick yeah. up on. And I feel like we say this about all the people anywhere in the world, yeah. but people in Central ice. America, they're so nice. <laughs> we, we say they're raised the ice because they are. Most people in the world are very nice. They're just so nice. And the food in Central America, I mean, you can't go wrong with that style of food. You so just many can't. spices and fresh yeah. produce in the tropical areas. Yeah. yeah so I'd say... Um, if you have more money, Costa Rica, and if you have less of a budget, then maybe something like Panama, it's a little Mm -hmm. bit more developing than Costa Rica, but it's definitely on the up and up and you can get a very similar climate Mm -hmm. for a fraction of the cost. So, uh, yeah, I'd say start there. If you're wanting an intro to like a really relaxing vacation, maybe something on a budget, consider like the islands, South America or Mm. not Consider the islands in the Caribbean, yeah. not South America. They can also vary a lot by cost. But if yeah. you book in advance, you can get a better deal, is yeah. what I'd say. Yeah. So, I mean, this is kind of our first episode on the, the 101 of traveling, of picking a place, of picking your destination. There are a lot of variables when it comes to picking your perfect trip. Mm-hmm. And if you are trying to pick one, you know, hopefully you can narrow it down a little bit. I feel like I just threw a lot of information. I feel like I haven't even scratched the surface. So we have four more episodes and we'll dive in deeper to some of these points where it helps you navigate it. So stay tuned. But if you have a question, as always, you can shoot us a message over on Instagram. You can mm-hmm. uh, email us. We will we will do our best to answer, but we will take all those questions and try to incorporate them into our future episodes. But this is just an intro. This is just a starting point of like, let's dig into this. Give yeah. us your, give us what you need to know. Let us know. Yeah. All right. We'll see you in the next episode. See ya. Thanks for listening to What No One Tells You with Chris and Sarah. If you have a comment or question that you want answered on the air, be sure to send us a message to hello at chrisandsarah.com or you can call or text our phone number at 423-825-9572. Thanks for listening.